So measuring past times, the radiocarbon dating method, which has got nothing to do with this. Radiocarbon dating is, is something which has really revolutionised archaeology. Remember how I was talking about um, Thompson and the three age system and how Danish scholars were saying, you know, how long have we been around? I mean, two centuries or 2,000 years or just exactly how long? Uh, the earliest historical dates only go back to roughly 3,500 BC. So to try and get dates for anything earlier, I mean, archaeologists basically guessed until the development of the radiocarbon dating technique, which completely revolutionised archaeology when first introduced in 1949 and gave archaeologists for the first time a reliable way of dating things in the past going back to roughly 30,000 BC. There are other methods that we can use as well. Well, radiocarbon dating is what we call a radiometric dating method. It's a dating method that relies on the natural decay of radioactive elements. Most natural elements are stable. They've got equal numbers of protons and neutrons, but many of them are unstable. They're radioactive. They've got extra neutrons or beta particles in addition to the standard number of protons. So here, for example, a helium uh, atom exploded, if, if you like, and you've got its protons and it's got neutrons, two protons, two neutrons. Uh, lithium is an unstable radioactive element. It's got an unequal number of protons in red, three there, and as you can see, it's got four neutrons as well. So this is radioactive. The point is that anything that's radioactive, the element that is radioactive will decay over a certain period of time. This period of decay, this rate of decay, is known as the half-life. The half-life is the term we give to the period over which one half of the amount of radioactivity would have disappeared, it would have changed into something else. Two half-lives means that you've gone that stage further. So um, one half-life, for example, I can't remember which one this is, here is 5,000 years, two half-lives is uh, 2,000, da, 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 so on and so on and so on. I'm getting it all wrong there, but never mind, anyway. You get the idea about, about the half-life. The half-life of some radioactive elements is literally a nanosecond. Ooh, but some of them, like potassium, 1,350,000 years. And then there's carbon, which is what I'm going to come on to. The first person to realize the potential of dating anything by radio radiometric methods, natural uh, radioactive decay, was Arthur Holmes. Um, who used the principle in 1910 uh, to establish that the oldest rocks in Britain dated to about two million years ago. Uh, think about this, 1910. 1859, when Darwin published The Origin of Species, people still only guessing about how old the Earth might be. If you went around saying, oh, it might be a million years old, people would laugh. Fifty years later, there's a method of actually dating it. This is really incredible. What about carbon-14 dating? Well, this is where we come to Willard Libby. Willard Libby was uh, researching cosmic radiation, how things got changed in the atmosphere thanks to the effect of the sun. And he was dragged into the Manhattan Project during the Second World War to develop the atomic bomb in America. He realised during his wartime work that carbon came in three different forms. Natural carbon, which is a fundamental thing in all living things and lots of dead things. Normal carbon, carbon-12, it's not radioactive, six protons, six neutrons. 
carbon-13, six protons and seven neutrons, and carbon-14, which has eight neutrons. Carbon-13 and carbon-14 are unstable, they are radioactive, they will decay over a period of time. This is, again, the half-life. By 1948, Willard Libby had discovered that what happens is that carbon combines with oxygen in the atmosphere to form carbon dioxide. It's absorbed by all living organisms. He believed at a regular rate while they're alive. When that organism dies, then carbon-14, carbon-13 start to decay, leaving only carbon-12. And you eventually, if you can measure the amount of carbon-14 that has decayed, then you can establish the, when that organism died. He came up with a half-life of about 5,568 years, something like that. In theory, he said, we can date anything going back to about 70,000 years before the present, BP before the present. The only problem was actually measuring the rate of decay. Um, what he discovered very early on were two problems. One is that after about 28,000, 29,000 years BP, BP is before present. Present in radioactive dating is 1950. I'll explain why later. But there's just too little radioactive carbon left to actually measure. The other problem he found was when he was setting up the method, discovering to his astonishment and great surprise that there were no reliable historical dates before about 3,000 years ago, <coughs> um, 3,000 BC. And I go, what? You mean I can date these things back to 30,000 years, but you can't give me anything older than 3,000 years? Anyway, he started to work on the method, and the original method used a light-sensitive clock to actually measure the decay of each carbon-14 atom, a beta particle. This was the most boring job in the world, because although it decays at a constant rate of 150 particles a minute, it slows down enormously as there's less and less carbon-14 left. And in fact, when he first developed the method, it would take a year to date one sample. So having worked out the theory, he then decided to test it. Um, we had ignored this from the standard deviations. What he did was he would take dated samples of wood, most of them from Egypt, that could be precisely dated for hieroglyphic inscriptions. He would burn these then measure the rate of decay of carbon-14, and he came up with pretty accurate dates. What he actually came up with was this. We called it the Libby Curve of Noans. He assumed that radioactive decay took place at a constant rate, so you'd have a basically a straight-line uh, graph representing decay. The oldest thing he was able to um, date was a piece of wood from one of the earliest Egyptian sites that could be dated to 2950 or thereabouts. And you can see he's got all these other bits and pieces of wood which he dated by the radiocarbon method, including a piece, um, piece from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, including a piece of burnt bread from Pompeii, and what he saw was that everything fitted in more or less into a very nice pattern like this. So, the radioactive um, dating method was introduced, 1949, and it really did revolutionise archaeology. This is the site of Jericho in the occupied West Bank. As you can see, it's a tell or hoyuk. It has been excavated in parts, um, it's also been robbed very badly. It was excavated in the 1930s, and at that time believed to be the oldest Neolithic settlement known of in the Middle East. 
uh, Neolithic, when farming develops and things like that. It was known from Egypt that there was active agriculture there in 3000 BC. It was assumed that Jericho was just a little bit older, 4500 BC. Radiocarbon dating pushed it back to 6280 BC. Suddenly, another 2000 years have been added to the history of the Neolithic period. Well, this sort of dating was done all over the um, Middle East at this time on a great variety of sites, and it really was a, v a revolution. And that's why Libby, although there is no Nobel Prize for archaeology, Libby is the only person who's got a Nobel Prize for archaeology in the sense that he made it possible to give an accurate dating system to the past. And he won the Nobel Prize uh, in 1960, uh, the actual quote I think was something to the effect of uh, in sort of two years work this man has f extended human history by 4,000 years, something like that. So good old Libby. Well, we call this introduction of radiocarbon dating the first radiocarbon revolution. The first radiocarbon revolution because for the first time archaeologists had a way of independently dating things before written history. The method seemed to work absolutely fantastically. But then in the 1960s, the price of radiocarbon dating came down, so more and more people were using it. Some problems began to be seen. Many of the prehistoric sites throughout the um, world were, seemed to be younger according to radiocarbon dates than other people thought they should be, allowing for stages of development. So it was decided to find out just how accurate radiocarbon dating was. And the way they chose to do this was through what we call calibration, fixing in a radiocarbon date with an accurate date. How this was done was through dendrochronology. <coughs> you all know, or you should all know, this should be one of the first things you ever learn when you grow up, that every year a tree puts on a new ring. So you cut a tree down, you count back the number of years, you get the exact date that tree started growing. This is what dendrochronology is all about, tree ring dating. If you look at a tree, you can see you've got different types of tree rings. Where you get these really wide tree rings, it's when you've got a very wet period, a uh, long wet period, not too hot. When you get these very narrow tree rings, you've got a very dry period, or it might be too hot. You can actually measure climate in terms of dendrochronology. I don't know if anybody here is a climate um, deterioration skeptic, but you look at tree rings and you'll see the message is very clearly there. But a great thing is about tree rings is, of course, you can count back from the edge to get the date of an individual tree ring. This was first realised by an American scientist who was studying sunspots. See all these things tied together, atomic bombs, sunspots, all sorts of things. Frederick Douglass began to think that sunspots, this was in the 1930s, um, sunspots appeared on a regular basis. Now, every so often you will read in the papers, oh heck, all the satellites are going to fail and your jet phones won't work because there's intense solar activity. This is the sunspot activity. And he was trying to work out if this happened on a regular basis. He thought it might be roughly every 11 years or so. So what he decided to do was to go all around North America, cutting down trees, taking wood from old wooden houses, to try and build up a complete series of tree rings going back as far as he could 
to see if he could see evidence of sunspot activity in the past. If there had been intense periods of sunspot activity in the past, then this should be represented in the tree rings. It, sunspot activity affects the climate. Well, of course, there are no living trees much older, you might think, than about 100 years or so. But what Douglas did was to take pieces of wood of a known date, compare it with preserved wood from somewhere else, match up the tree rings, and then you can start counting back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, da 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 da, nine, ten, <coughs> eleven, all the way back like that, cross matching. This is how it's done, basically. You cut down a tree, you get your tree ring pattern, you get an old piece of wood, this is what he literally did. He got um, some wood from Arizona, from preserved native Indian houses, he was able to match the rings up and go back and go back and go back and go back in time. Well, he did find that there was some evidence in the tree rings that matched up with what he predicted as cycles of sunspot activity. Every 22 years uh, or so, peaks every uh, 11 years or thereabouts. He also, quite surprisingly, gave archaeologists the first date for native Indian settlement in Arizona, which had all died out before Europeans got there, but now we could actually date their building. So, through retrieving dating, you see, you can go right back. And what people were doing in the 1960s was taking a dated tree ring, burning it, seeing what the carbon-14 content was, what its age was in carbon-14 years, and what its real age was. As more and more research was done on this, people started to discover some very, very surprising things. See this little tree here? It grows in California. Doesn't look very impressive. Two people here know this little tree. You know how old it can be? <coughs> that one and that one started growing 4,000 years ago. And they're still growing. These are the oldest living trees you can find in the world. And taking samples from these, it was possible to check carbon-14 dating system. You got an accurate date from the centre of that tree 4,000-something years ago. In Ireland, archaeologists started to find these, what we call bog oaks, preserved pieces of wood that are found in peat bogs. By looking at the tree rings here, dendrochronology, tree ring dating, we can go right back and identify a tree that was growing 8,000 years ago. Pretty impressive. Pine trees in Germany go back to 10,000 years ago. The importance of dendrochronology with regard to carbon-14 dating was that you could take a piece of wood of an exactly known year date. Submit it to the radiocarbon dating technique and find out where the problem was. The problem turned out to be that the radiocarbon date did not always match a calendar date. The reasons for this are rather complex, but it's uh, concerned with a type of organism um, seashells, for example, absorb old carbon-14 from the water. Uh, plants absorb more carbon-14 than humans. Uh, sunspot activity affects the amount of carbon-14 in the air, all sorts of things like that. The real half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years, not 5,568. So there were problems in that particular way. But what dendrochronology made it possible to do was to actually create a calibration curve. Well, what's that? Well, strictly speaking, of course, I mean, time is a continuum like that. It's a straight line graph. 
But because of variations in carbon-14 in the atmosphere, what we find is a carbon-14 date of 6,000 BC is a thousand, two thousand years younger than it, uh, it um, is a thousand years younger than it should really be. It should be 7,000 BC. So we call this introduction of this method of testing carbon-14 dates the second radiocarbon revolution. And it came up with some beautiful, beautiful surprises. Stonehenge. Who's going to do Stonehenge for their essay presentation? Nobody? Oh, Stonehenge is a nice one. Stonehenge. It was always believed that prehistoric man living in England was too stupid to make anything, you know, like this without influence from the Egyptians or from the Mycenaean people. It was always thought that the idea of stone buildings spread from Egypt to Crete into the Mediterranean world slowly spread out so stone ends out here. Well, if the earliest stone buildings in Egypt are 3000 BC, then Stonehenge can't be any older than 1500 BC. Radiocarbon dating, thanks to the second radiocarbon um, revolution, shows that Stonehenge is older than the pyramids. This method of building was developed in Britain quite independent of anything happening in the Mediterranean world. So, you can see how, starting off with a simple idea, radioactive decay, using this to date rocks, coming up with the idea of radio uh, carbon dating, uh, that you can actually date organic remains from the decay of carbon-14 in them. Realising there's a problem with this, so it has to be checked by dendrochronology, brings it up to this particular thing. Well, you might think, you know, the way I use radiocarbon dates, that these are fantastic, you know, these are great. I mean, no problems with radiocarbon dates. There are problems. Because of the variations in radioactive carbon in the atmosphere, it's absorbed at different rates by different organisms, so there's no one constant sort of absorption rate and decay rate. And what we actually find are these things called wiggles. There are some periods in the past when there's more carbon-14 in the atmosphere, so it gives us a, an old date, or rather a young date, and some periods in the past when there was less, so it gives us an older date. And the problem really comes like this. There are some periods in the past when we can't come out with an absolute date. We call this the wiggle problem. Because it wiggles, 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 like that. This is what the wiggle problem is. You can have a radiocarbon date of 4385. In reality, it could be 3025 years ago, 2973 years ago, 2447 years ago. You see? <coughs> When you read, if you read anything about radiocarbon dates, and somebody says it's radiocarbon dated to such and such a year, you go, eh, you can't do it. For some periods in the, in the past, it's virtually impossible to come up with an accurate date. Now sometimes you can get what we call a good wiggle match. We can say with 95.4% probability that this is 8, uh, 830 BC. 68% probability it is but around about 808 BC, 748 BC. You get a nice sort of spit point like that. But unfortunately, there's some period in history where this doesn't work. Remember when I was talking about Holstadt and the problems with dating Holstadt? The radiocarbon dates, unfortunately, just don't fit in. The Holstadt period can be anywhere between 2,450 years before the present to 2,410 uh, years before the present. We've got big problems with dating the whole step um, episode. It just doesn't work. 
But nonetheless, radiocarbon dating, in very general terms, this is actually a really severe problem for trying to understand the Iron Age in Anatolia, where we are. We just cannot get dates closer than about 50 years. Well, 50 years is not a lot, is it? Well, it is. If you're trying to work out whether site A is older than site B, you want to know which one's the oldest. But then we come to the third radiocarbon revolution. Up to this point, the method of dating relied on actually counting the rate of decay of carbon-14 in a sample. And somebody had the brilliant idea of saying, well, the amount of carbon-12 that's absorbed is equal to the amount of carbon-14, and carbon-12 doesn't decay. Why don't we just measure how much carbon-14 is left compared with how much carbon-12? Wonderful. The only problem is you need an atomic energy source to do this. But you can do it. And they came up with this, the AMS method. The AMS method does this particular uh, calculation. It can calculate how much is actually gone. You don't have to count it decaying. You can you do a date using this method in 24 hours. With the old methods of carbon-14 dating, you could have to wait a year. You know the great thing about this? The old days of carbon-14 dating, you needed one kilogram sample. A whole kilogram. It would take a year to date it. With this particular machine, you can date a blood spot on a flint knife. Blood spot. You can date a single seed in 24 hours. It's very expensive, very accurate, and very efficient. You come up with some pretty surprising things. Because we can actually, thanks to using sea cells, push radiocarbon dating back even further than the 30,000 years that was originally possible. It's not without its problems, but it is coming up with some quite interesting things. If you read carbon-14 dates that have been done much more recently, they would have been done by the AMS method. They're going to be very accurate. Literally, within two or three years in some cases, I mean, it's absolutely astounding. Dendrochronology is still the best way of dating something, counting the tree rings all the way back. And it's through dendrochronology that the big um, tumulus at Gordian, we know it can't be the burial chamber of King Midas, because King Midas died sometime around 590, and that burial chamber was built about 640 BC, using wood that was already 4,000 years old. How about that? Amazing, isn't it? But I put this one up just to show you one of the controversial things that's uh, come out of using the new method. This is what's known as the Turin Shroud. It's a piece of cloth that's first reported uh, on in about 1250, 1290. It's now preserved in Turin in Italy. Uh, it was seen, it's, it's a creamy coloured cloth, it was seen to have this sort of shadowy image of a figure, front and back. The cloth comes down, you've got the impression of the figure on the back. Uh, a photographer in 1909 took a photograph and realised when looking at the negative, you could see the image much more clearly. Well, you can see it's a bearded person with a moustache. Uh, you can see he's got his hands crossed there. And closer examination would seem to reveal a series of wounds. Um, although the Catholic Church had never actually said that this was the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, many Christians believe that this is what it is. There have been tests done. The, the, the stain is caused by some iron compound. Well, that would tie up with it being blood. But nobody's ever been able to make a replica work out how this image was formed. First reported in 1250, 1290, and a lot of people believe it is the burial shroud of um, Christ. AMS dating. Now, AMS dating allows you to date a single seed. 
So for the first time ever, they were able to actually date this. Three separate laboratories were involved in dating this, and they were able to show the cloth it was made from was prepared, it's a linen cloth, between 1260 and 1390, which ties in with the earliest recorded date of this in the literature. So, AMS method used in detective stories. You'll probably be reading about this in the, the uh, Turin Shroud Code, or somebody called Dan Brown, uh, like the Da Vinci Code, or something like that. So this is just a filling class, really. I just wanted to um, tell you something about radiocarbon dating, because we, I will be doing uh, using radiocarbon dating a bit more in our next few classes. And I think I'll finish nice and early, so you can all run off and go home, go straight to the library,